Philip Rossetti is a, the Senior Fellow for Energy and Environment at the R Street Institute, where he conducts research on energy, climate, and environmental policy. Mr. Rossetti, Mr. Rossetti previously served as a fellow on the minority staff of our committee, so welcome back to him. Uh, Mr. Rossetti, you're up. You're recognized for five minutes to present your testimony. Welcome. Thank you, Chairman McCaster, Ranking Member Graves, and honorable members of the committee for inviting me to testify on the Inflation Reduction Act today. Uh, I want to cover three key points about the Inflation Reduction Act. One is the overall potential environmental impact of the legislation. Two are the barriers to actually achieving that outcome. And three is the overall economic impact uh, as the incidents of subsidies are going to have to be paid for by taxes elsewhere in the economy, what effect this might have. Uh, so overall, the environmental impact at our street, we took a, a look at the total estimated cost of the IRA and just took at honest value the CBO's estimate and, and said, okay, you know, if this is true, how much clean energy can this buy? And compare that to the Energy Information Administration's projected baseline. Uh, and looking at that, the sheer volume subsidy, which is hundreds of billions of dollars, does result in an increase in purchases. And we would expect about a 37% increase in clean electricity uh, production over the baseline and some modest effects in the transportation sector, uh, with overall a potential of about 12% emission reduction relative to 2005 levels, which is pretty consistent with the rhodium group that estimated about 8 to 12% and other studies. The caveat to this, though, is the low cost of renewables and high investment potential already means that most of this technology would have already been deployed uh, irrespective of the IRA. So we estimate about 67% of the clean electricity subsidies will go to clean energy production that would have occurred even absent the IRA. Uh, similarly, with the EV tax credits, we do see uh, a huge increase in, uh, uh, in the, or excuse me, we see a, a, a large amount of the subsidies go to EVs that probably would have been deployed anyway, as the yeah, I expects a close to 6 million new EVs being deployed and, uh, and the tax rates support about 1 million new EVs. In this environment, we expect that the additionality of these subsidies and the potential environmental benefit is mitigated by the fact that most of the money would go to efforts that would already occur uh, without the IRA. In terms of actually getting to that potential 12% emission reduction, it's largely locked behind regulatory factors. Uh, increasingly, we're hearing from the clean energy space that they're facing regulatory barriers rather than cost barriers to new deployment. So there's close to 1,000 gigawatts of low carbon electricity and interconnection queues in the United States right now. The interconnection queue timelines have gone from about two years to close to four years. And we hear from some developers that it can even be about eight years in some areas. Uh, the transmission uh, adequacy is, is not really good. The transmission congestion costs in many of the interconnections are increasing, you know, sometimes by multiple times. Uh, we also have uh, increasing curtailment in the renewable space. So a lot of areas are already saturated with new renewables and deploying more renewables means that there's a, a diminishing return. So without that increased transmission and availability to actually get new clean energy to where it needs to go, you're not gonna get environmental benefit. And the repeat project, which is probably one of the most optimistic estimates of the IRA's effects, uh, that estimated that about 80% of their emission potential is locked behind transmission growth. So actually getting to this environmental outcome requires structural changes in, in regulatory policy, especially on the permitting. It's been very interesting. At R Street, we looked at the DOE and BLM's permitting uh, uh, for clean energy, and we noted that about 42% of DOE's projects were related to clean energy, conservation, transmission, only 15% were fossil fuel, uh, similar ratios in BLM. And just looking at the federal permitting dashboard today, 65% of the energy projects are renewable projects. So addressing these issues are key to clean energy growth and are largely absent from the IRA. Additionally, it's important to consider the full economic impacts of any legislation. Every dollar that is going to be spent on subsidy by the U.S. government is going to result in a dollar of tax somewhere else. Uh, so who's going to pay that tax is largely going to determine the overall economic impact of any legislation. Uh, so when it comes to the IRA, where we know that uh, a huge portion of it is going to be from corporate taxes, we also have to ask, okay, who's going to be paying those taxes? The CBO notes that higher corporate rates are going to overall reduce the investment, the incentives to invest in the United States are going to have negative economic effects. 
Uh, the tax foundation, similarly, and looking at the IRA, estimates about a 0.2% lower GDP in the long run and uh, lower long run income so across the board for Americans. Um, there are some positive effects of the IRA, namely the deficit reduction, uh, and these can offset to a certain degree the negative impacts of the tax increases. Uh, but overall, when we look at the studies, it generally shows about a wash. Uh, so with that, you know, it's important to consider that what are we getting, how much is it going to cost, and who's going to pay for it? And I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Mr. Rossetti, in your testimony, you state that the impact of this bill will transfer wealth from American taxpayers to subsidize energy companies. Proponents of the bill claim that the most of the taxes raised by the legislation are paid for by wealthy corporations. Can you explain why that is a misleading assumption and who will actually bear the burden of the book minimum tax? Uh, that's an excellent question. So when we think about the effects of the corporate tax, the important thing to keep in mind is at the end of the day, humans are the ones who pay taxes, even corporate taxes. So most people who say that we should do corporate taxes try to say, well, you know, it's the investors of the corporations who bear the tax. And that might have been true in an environment where we had a more closed economy, but now we have a globally competitive economy and corporations have to compete everywhere. Uh, so under those conditions, the research increasingly shows that workers and consumers of corporations pay a larger share of the corporate income tax. So the IRAs uh, tax on what they call super normal returns, which is uh, kind of a more recent term. Even that is expected out of about 50% of its costs call, fall on corporate workers. Uh, so when we look at these taxes, we have to understand if investors are able to shift the incidence of the tax onto other entities, we would expect them to do so. Uh, and I don't think the IRA is any different in that regard. So is the taxpayer funded renewable subsidies the best way to lower global emissions or would money be better spent more effectively elsewhere? Uh, I would say that's probably not the best policy because one of my concerns with climate change is this is a global challenge. So when I look at this sort of policy of continued indefinite subsidy for renewable energies and other energy priorities, it's communicating to the rest of the world, especially the developing world where they have far lower incomes relative to Americans, that these technologies are only viable with continued subsidy. And really the key is actually having lower real costs, not lower uh, subsidized costs. I yield back my time. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and thanks so much to our witnesses. Um, Mr. Rosetti, I'd like to focus on you, and, I, and I, I really want to emphasize the areas that we have a lot that we agree on, but I, I don't want to presume on what we agree. Um, so let me just start with things that I, I'm, I'm thinking we're on the same page on, but number one, would you agree with me that, that competition helps lower inflation? Competitive markets make things cheaper. Uh, well, I'd say supply is probably going to be the key to lowering inflation. Inflation is caused by too many dollars. I'm, I'm just, just asking a yes or no. Are you, are you pro-market competition as a tool to lower inflation? Yeah. we're Okay, pro terrific. We're on the same page. Do you, do you agree with me that subsidies make markets inefficient? I would agree that subsidies make market, markets inefficient. Terrific. And, and, and I know you used to be a Hill lobbyist. Um, is your experience similar to mine that it's vastly more common that corporations lobby for lower taxes than it is that they come in and lobby for higher minimum wages? Was that your uh, experience? I've never been a lobbyist, so I can't speak to that. But you were on the Hill for a while. Surely you ran into some people who were coming and making asks of us. Uh, well, I, I know that you know lobbyists are always going to pursue the war. Uh, do, you, do you find that corporate America is regularly asking for higher minimum wages or lower taxes? This is not a trick question. I, I'd say that you know corporations are always going to ask for lower taxes. Okay, Ter terrific. The reason I let me ask you something, Mr. Rosetti. Most electric vehicle models on the market today won't qualify for this EV tax credit. Is, is that your understanding of that? Uh, that is my understanding. The narrower constraint of the new EV tax credit is going to mitigate the eligibility across uh, existing EV producers. Is that going to result in more EVs on the road? Uh, well, according to the estimates of the new EV tax credit, which we show would only support about a million EVs, that's far lower than the projected uptake even without the IRA. So uh, I, I don't see that specific tax credit as having a, a huge benefit to new EV market uptake. The EV tax credits that are in the Inflation Reduction Act, who do they, that, that are written in law, who benefits from them? That's a, a great question. So when we think about the tax credits for new EVs, that's obviously going to benefit people who are buying new EVs. But I'm also a bit skeptical of the used EV tax credit. 
because the expectation is that people are buying used vehicles would benefit the most from having their purchasing power increased. But we'd also expect people who already have EVs that are going to sell them would do so anyway. So they might be able to charge a higher price because of the used EV tax credit, which might actually uh, inadvertently benefit people who already own EVs. And are well, I'm about out of time. I, I thank you for your answer. Mr. Rossetti, I, I understand that, that you, you took some lumps earlier in, in regard to some of your statements on the IRA. I wanted to give you a chance to, to clarify uh, some, of, some of your remarks. Uh, sure. You know, one thing that I thought was a little interesting was that uh, you know, Representative Kasten, I think, correctly pointed out that subsidies do distort markets and actually reduce competition and therefore make things more expensive in the long run, uh, yet then defended the extremely large subsidies in the IRA. And, and, uh, it seems to be contradictory. Uh, but one thing I also think is important to note is uh, the IMF is frequently cited for its estimate of also fuel subsidies, but that estimate is almost entirely contingent upon an estimate that, uh, that if carbon is not taxed, that therefore that equates to a subsidy, which is kind of similar logic to saying that you're you know, robbing or subsidizing your local bank by not robbing it. Um, if the Democrats wanted to implement a carbon tax to address that, if they truly believe that, then uh, they certainly could have under budget reconciliation provisions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Rossetti. Mr. Rossetti, are you a lobbyist? Absolutely not. And are you, are you advocating for solutions that are economically sustainable? Economically sustainable climate solutions are key to actually bring down global emissions. You look at where emissions are growing, it's developing nations. So if you want something that's going to help us in the long term, especially address these, uh, these impacts that many are so concerned about, you need to have technology that's low in cost, exportable, and going to be deployable in communities that might have a fifth or less of the income of a typical American household. Uh, Madam Chair, I think the, the point Mr. Rossetti just made is, is absolutely key, that, that ensuring that the technologies that the, that the federal government is involved in, that there is a path to economic sustainability because that is the only way that you achieve a path to environmental sustainability. And, and otherwise, you're creating the volatility. And I think Mr. Rossetti just made the point that the government's actions right now, we're seeing higher emissions. As I noted in my opening statement, we're seeing one quarter of all Americans unable to afford food, medicine, or energy. And, and we're seeing greater energy insecurity. And that would, even Secretary Blinken just this week went to other countries asking them for critical mineral supplies that we have right here in the United States. So I... I think, again, we share objectives in regard to lower emissions and a sustainable trajectory, but I think maybe a different pathway of getting there would make a lot more sense. Yield back. All right, next up, Mr. Kramer.